definitely the money makers. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to let people join. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, so I'm going to give them a few minutes. And it's 6 o'clock here in Chicago and 7 o'clock in New York and all the other random times in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's 5 o'clock somewhere. That's all we care about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for joining. I think this is leaned where usually... I guess it does do that. Oh, it's gonna I can move closer. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm trying to fix something, you guys. Sorry about this. I guess this doesn't really matter. It's I'm more concerned about you. Um, shout out to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, for those of you out there who have never tuned in, uh, my name is Lucy Sweetkill. I'm actually a professional dominatrix from New York City, but I am visiting Chicago these last few days and uh, have the pleasure of interviewing a very well-known Chicago mistress who's been in the scene for a very long time and I'm gonna let her introduce herself and give her story <laughs> um, so uh, mistress Simone can you introduce yourself by letting the audience know names and titles um, how long you know you've been in the business and if you do anything outside of pro doming because I know a lot of us kind of have other things we do too all right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining myself and Miss Lucy Sweetkill. I'm very honored that she asked me. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, my titles are two. First, it is Mistress Simone, and that is professional. When I started, pretty much we were all Mistress, Goddess, Lady, pick a name. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot of last names. I think Myrene Boss might have been one of the first ones that had a last name. Mm. Ah. So, and my lifestyle name, the name I prefer to be called in is Ma'am. I know, I'm one of those weird ladies. I actually don't have a problem being called Ma'am. <laughs> I actually like I it. I don't either. No, good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have been a professional dominatrix for 25 years. This is my 25th year anniversary. <gasps> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's a mile marker. I'm very honored and happy to have been doing this for 25 years. I have been in Chicago for 25 years and in St. Louis, which is my second city, for... 10, 11 years. I am duly located. I go back and forth. Cool. And I have two dungeons, one here, which you can see, yeah. <laughs> and then one in St. Louis. Mm. Outside of this, are you referring to yeah, because, like hobbies well, <laughs> or because you kink. Um, author, you've, yes. you know, so, so uh, that's a really long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> But I am a, a international leather title holder, Ooh. and I have a podcast, a female domination podcast, which I'll have to come to New York and interview you for, yeah. tit for tat. And here. what's that called? <laughs> it is the Femdom Mystique. Oh, awesome. And I have done it for about five years. I probably should be a little bit better, more regimented like you. <laughs> But it covers female domination topics, and I do awesome. interview some of the well-known lifestyle and professional dominatrix. So I'll come to New York and visit you. Cool. I also have authored a book. It is the Toy Bag Guide to Chastity, which is one of my huge things. So it covers basic. Oh, well, we're definitely going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm a lifestyle mistress. I own five slaves at this time, I think. So it's not only my profession, but it is my life. Mm. Awesome. All right, so we're going to go a little bit back in history. And, you know, for those of you out there, I know you're going to have a lot of questions. It's the Wayback Machine. <laughs> Can you please write down um, your questions? Because we will have a Q&A because Mistress Simone might answer a lot of those questions already. So please write them down um, and we'll get it. We'll have the Q&A later and you can ask your questions if they don't get in, uh, if they, she hasn't already answered them. All right, so we're going to go back. So what is one of your first, and I like to break this in two ways. What are your first kind of keen BDSM-esque experiences, sexual and non-sexual? And for I know for a lot of people, they remember like either being like one of these bossy girls when they're really younger <laughs> or were into like, you know, for me, I remember biting kids. 
All obviously right. it wasn't sexual, but it was this thing I really loved to do and kind of built, you know, my sadism makes sense. So those are like the non-sexual experiences. And then of course the sexual experiences. What were your first kind of kink BDSM, at, you know, sexual experience? Hmm. All right, so my non-sexual experience would probably have been when I was about five. It's the first one that I can remember. Mm -hmm. And my mother always said I was, you know, the bossy little girl. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> so I was at my birthday party and I got a tricycle. Ooh. I know. <laughs> and instead of riding the tricycle myself, I had one of the neighborhood boys ride it. And at that time, the tricycles had the steps on the back. Yeah. So I stood on the steps and I put my hands on his shoulder and made him ride me around my birthday party. That's about right. It, that yeah doesn't <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of fits. Yes. And my mother said, "Well, that kind of makes sense." You know. <laughs> so and and he then became my little slave boy for like the next year, and he would come over and ride me around the yard and do what I want. <laughs> oh, that's really cute. Yeah. <laughs> I had I was wearing my little pur purple dress and you know of course then you had little bobby socks and and penny loafers and I just rode behind him and said let's go over did here. Did that now. ever upgrade to like someone pulling you around in a wagon? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a sled. <laughs> a toboggan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it cart me all over. <laughs> then my first sexual experience I would say was when I was 15 with my high school sweetheart. And we were both kind of experimenting, and I kind of knew I was kinky. The tricycle thing just got worse as I got older. Yeah. <laughs> I had fun with Barbie and Ken. And we were fooling around, and he asked to be spanked. Oh. And I said, most definitely. So. Did you guys ever talk about that, or was it just like... It was foreplay. Kind of, oh, right. Yes, so it, was, just... it was foreplay. Mm. Right. He said, you know, I'd really like it if you kind of spanked me and just smacked my ass. And I did that. And then we progressed from there to me tying him up, using some furry ah. handcuffs and some rope. Whoa. And then some light ball kicking. And yeah, remember, we're like 15, 16, 17. Wow. We dated for a couple of years. So, yeah. <sighs> wow. So, do you feel, so you have mentioned that you had always kind of felt, a bit kinky so there's obviously mm -hmm. the younger dominant stuff that happened when you were younger mm -hmm. and then had you kind of always been in this very like dominant role did you kind of feel very secure in that as you were like getting older or mm -hmm. were there things that happened no, I, to me, I've never really had a problem expressing my sexuality or my dominance. It's just kind of part of who I am. And sometimes my partner has to remind me that other people don't have that same confidence and security. Okay. So I have to be a little bit more empathetic. Yeah. Because <laughs> to me, it's like, well, what's the problem? You know, you're dominant, let's go. So I've always been naturally that way. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if it's because I'm an only child. Ah. <laughs> but I've never really had a problem expressing my sexual needs, my dominance, any of those. It's kind of come as a second uh, nature to me. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, has your family always been supportive of that? Yes. So did you come from a very sex positive family? I guess that's a better question. Well, um, when I, <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Um, how to say this without like, making myself sound really, really ancient. Sex positive wasn't a thing yeah. <laughs> when I was growing up, but I had a very good, strong parental unit. I had great parents and, uh, you know, I, we had sex ed in, in school. My mother was very informative about relationships. So I had a very strong, supportive sex, what you would probably call a sex positive environment. Yeah. But back then it wasn't a sex positive environment. It was just a good, strong family unit. Yeah, because, you know, like my family, you just like Asian people, a lot of times, especially immigrant Asian families, they do not talk about sex, any kind, mm -hmm. nothing, you know, n n none of it. It's all of a sudden kind somehow. Of taboo. Yeah, it's all this, of a sudden you get married somehow. You know, <laughs> like not where you don't get you know, an instruction you manual or anything. anything. Oh nothing. God, sorry. So, that, so it's one of those things where I, you know, I always wonder how people's families were. What like did they talk about it? Did they, you know, give you more? You know, give you more than the you know penis goes in vagina baby talk or like how right. that was. So they are much more open about. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So it made you feel very secure in kind of vocalizing what you wanted. Yes. And mm -hmm. what you needed. Yeah. Which is quite rare. I've never had a problem it. telling anybody what I want, honey. Yeah. <laughs>
ever. <laughs> you know, it's... ask my husband ever. <laughs> <laughs> so then, okay, so you started exploring with mm -hmm. your first, your you know, sweet first sweetheart. Right, my high school sweetheart. Yeah. Mm. And then where did it go from there? Where did you, how were your late teens into your twenties? Because when did you start doming? Professionally or yeah. lifestyle? Both. Well, I would consider myself starting doming when I was about 17 or 18. Mm. Okay. Because Chicago has a very strong gay leather community okay. and heterosexual leather community. So there were outlets for me at that time. There were like fetish nights and, you know. And you knew <laughs> the, the kind of terminology. Yes. Like you had started to explore it mm -hmm. and you started picking up the terminology. Correct. As part mm. of like. I was very self aware and self actualization in regards to exploring my desires and my kinks. Awesome. I kind of stemmed from the goth. Uh, heavy metal side yeah. where I would go to the local clubs and fetish was kind of intermingled with that and you kind of just meet people from there yeah. and someone will be into fetish and someone will be into kink so the worlds are very intertwined in Chicago and then once I started breaking into that world I was able to find the actual outlets that are for that mm. yeah so yeah. what were some of those outlets when you were kind of doing lifestyle stuff well what we used to have fetish nights okay. <laughs> over by Belmont and Clark there's a theater and they would have fetish markets and flea markets there was a group called uh, I'm gonna get this wrong CBG C CDG and that was so long ago and they were one of the first lifestyle groups in Chicago and they would have monthly meetings at a restaurant and Ooh. since I was 18 I could go to the restaurant and meet people <laughs> Also, as well, I would go to some of the gay leather stores, and then I could talk to the guys there. And I remember we used to have a male hide leathers, and I got my first leather dress there. And the, the gay boy owners just loved selling it to me. It was great. Yeah. I had a very good, solid background in regards to uh, support and networking. And I think it's because I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in Chicago. Mm. Yeah, that's so. really amazing yeah. that you had all that support and kind of these outlets for mm -hmm. it, right? Um, I know some people aren't as lucky and I try wow. to educate when I can to people who don't have that same experience because yeah. I was very cherished. And so then being part of that community, sort of how did that transition to program work for you? So uh, my lifestyle kink uh, continued and it didn't segue into professional until I turned 27. Okay. Is what, if I if I do my math right. <laughs> yeah. 26, 27. And I had, at that time, I was running a fetish store, lingerie store in Chicago called Taboo Taboo. Ooh. Which <laughs> I made into a very heavy, heavy fetish store. Now it's kind of gone more stripper, lingerie stuff. Yeah. But it was owned by the gentleman who owns the, the alley which is a big alternative store in Chicago. So I would run, I was running the sex store, fetish store, and a lot of my customers were local pro doms. Yeah. And they knew that I was a lifestyle bomb. They knew that, you know, I had boys, I had girls that served me and so they'd see me out at the fetish nights. So they would come in, they'd bring their clients, they'd bring their sissies. We would shop, we would have fun. You know, we'd dress the sissies up, put corsets on, the slaves would buy her a corset, they'd buy me a corset. And it was just a lot of fun. So I loved my job. Yeah. Well, one of them was an educator, and she would come in and she would teach classes, and her and I became very close friends. And she said to me, she goes, you know, you'd really like this. You should do this professionally at one time. And, and, and I said, I'm not going to have sex with anybody. She goes, I don't have sex with my slaves. I don't have sex with my clients. I said, well, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> let's have lunch and discuss this. Yeah. And after that, I apprenticed at a local house and mentored with her. And I, back then, the apprenticeship was one year where you did not take clients. You worked with another dom, and you went from dom to dom to dom and learned each skill. Yeah. So you learned your skill. You were practicing it. You didn't just pick up a whip and go, look, I'm a dom. Yeah. Well, first year, I didn't take any clients on my own. I, uh, you know, I got a small tip at the end. Then that was it. Year Next year, I started taking clients on my own. That's awesome. So, and then I worked for her for that year and gave her the house cut because if you work for a house, you know the house gets a cut. Yeah. All right. And after my second year, I said, mm, I wasn't crazy about the 3 a.m. calls. Yeah. Ew. So you were working, <laughs> so it was like you had to, you were working into 3 a.m. Like, what was the cutoff on those hours? There wasn't any. There wasn't. No. Uh -oh. 
No. <laughs> Back then there wasn't any. If, if a client wanted to see you at 4 a.m., then she would call you and you would have to get up and get ready and go see a client at 4 a.m. Mm. Wow. It was all about the clients and what they wanted. And, you know, so I wasn't crazy about that. I, I wasn't crazy about my phone ringing at 3 a.m. And I also wanted to specialize. Yeah. I didn't want to see clients across the board for every fetish yeah I wanted to kind of build my skill for the things that I really 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 loved yeah and so it was like I want to do what I want I want to focus on the skills I like and I'm not going to do the 3 a.m. calls yeah. I want to have my own control yeah. so after two years at the house I opened my own space that's awesome thank you mm. and then um, so then that will just lead me to what were the things that you wanted to do what were the things that lifestyle you first got into that you were exploring that you were curious about and then how has that evolved and what you know you said you wanted to focus on you know specialize in certain things and what were those well I think every every Dom who gets into this we kind of start at the same space yeah you know spanking flogging basic bondage foot worship yeah all right kind of just the basic skill level I was more interested in the heavier medical play, yeah. which is a very big specialty of mine. I enjoy that kind of play, so I wanted to delve more into that. I wanted to go heavier into the heavy bondage, cool. the mummification, the full encasement, things like that, mm -hmm. and a heavy C CBT. So, and again, can they kind of all kind of cross over? Yeah. yeah, you should, you know that. So those were the three areas that I really wanted to kind of focus on. I you know I love my spanking, I really do, and caning, and was another area that I really wanted to focus on. So when you first started, so when you were exploring mm -hmm. with um, you know your first kind of boyfriend and like doing the spanking, like what were you really interested in when you guys were exploring? What was that? Some of the first things you were like, oh, was it more the power dynamic or? Or was it some of the actual activities that you were doing with him? No, I think it was more about the control. Okay. I like uh, giving sensation. I like controlling the sensation of yeah. my partner and getting the reaction back. Yeah. So that's, to me, that's more of what it is and what it was for us. Mm. Yeah. It was he wanted me to take control and I wanted it. Mm. Yeah. And then, so then you started kind of at the house. Mm-hmm doing apprentice work mm -hmm. and then left started mm -hmm. your own that's pretty like that's a really I mean I guess you've had a lot of experience doing a lot of lifestyles so like that sort mm -hmm. of turnaround wasn't that hard for you no. mm -hmm. and then when you started and what was that journey like when you started your own place like what has that been like for you well it was a very big step yeah because all of a sudden I'm a self-employed business owner yeah. So I basically have to learn all that fun stuff, you know, how to file my taxes, how to keep my books, yeah. uh, how to budget my equipment, how to get my clients, my advertising. So not only was I learning more about how to be an independent dom and how to connect with the people that were coming to see me, but I was also learning the business structure. Yeah. And that was, you know, at age 27, you know, a bit daunting. Yeah. <laughs> I managed it, <laughs> but it, that was probably the daunting part of it. It was like, all right, you actually have to, you know, put more time into it. You can't just walk into a dungeon and go do your session and leave. I mean, you yeah. can if you want, stay working at a house. But if you want to be an independent dom, as you know, it takes a lot of work. So much a work. A lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of work behind the scenes. Yeah. So for every hour, two, three, four we spend in the dungeon, we're tripling that with off you know cleaning yeah. buying supplies maintaining our equipment yeah all the 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 computer laptop all that work you know I didn't have that back then honey <laughs> <laughs> back then it was advertising in newspapers <laughs> do you miss that yes I do yes I do I do but I don't the ever the the internet has opened up our world so much that yeah. I think it has really helped a lot of people who felt alone yeah and didn't realize that their kink didn't make them a bad person didn't make them weird didn't make them uh, just an outcast so yeah. I think it, it helped people feel more connected and realizing that hey there's people out there who will facilitate and help me with this yeah. and I can go see a lady who you know has these assets or has these assets and she'll beat my ass yeah 
So I think the internet was very good for that, yeah. but it was also very good for a lot of time wasters and phonies to come out and, yeah, and both ends, both pro doms and clients. Yeah. And so now you have to vet. You know? When I started, we didn't have to do deposits. And now I won't, I won't do a session without a deposit. Mm. Yeah. Because I, Which, I guess that the people who were searching for you were really searching for you. Right. Mm. You know, because it, there wasn't that many outlets. Right. So would you say like, you know, for someone who's kind of been in the dom world, but mostly through an internet related thing, what are like the biggest differences besides the advertising, you know? I think the biggest difference is, well, the advertising is a very big one. Yeah. The method of introduction is a yeah. very big one. So way back one in the way back machine, <laughs> uh, a submissive had to write a letter of introduction ah. or make a phone call. And then there was an intake. They didn't come straight to the dungeon. Yeah. They got met for coffee and discussed and interest you know, reviewed to see if they were vetted. And then they could possibly have their session the next day. Okay. So it was a it was a labor of love for the clients back then. They really, really had to put an effort into showing that they wanted to have a session with us. Yeah. Instead, now I get texts at 3 a.m. going, can I suck your toes? Yeah. So that's probably the biggest difference for me is that I really enjoyed the etiquette of how a sincere submissive approached me. Yeah. And now I get, you know, one-liners. I'm sure you get the same thing, you mm -hmm. know. Or, you know, hey, can I see your tits? Yeah. Well, this is about what you're going to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just I think there's a, a modicum of decorum that's gone yeah. that I miss. Would you? Now the, the and I hate, I don't, I'm an, I do not like doing ageism, so I hate to do age class. But the age of people who are in their 40s, 30s, 20s, they have a lot more access to instant fetishism. Yeah. They can go online and find a video for foot. They can go online and find a video for bondage. So their their sincerity, they want it right there and right now. Yeah. yeah. So do I still have submissives that are very sincere? Yes. Uh, I just met a, a wonderful new submissive last week who she did everything right. <laughs> she did, did all the hoops. But for one of her, there's now 10 that don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you have the same the same issue. Mm. Yeah, I think that's it's a very interesting thing. It's this instant gratification, right, that they want compared to like working for it. And I think some of the submissives I've seen who've been in the business for a long time or been in the industry a long time, it's like you. See, it, it's definitely a different way that you go about. Like it's very about serving. Yes, and not about like. Serving themselves. Correct. Yeah, they're, they're, they were a lot more about the power exchange and, like you said, serving. And long term. And long term. Yeah. And developing a connection with the Dom of their choice. Yeah. Instead of instantly getting gratification for their own fetish and then going on to the next Dom and the next Dom and the next Dom and Do the next Dom. Do you see mm. more slutting around? Oh, yeah. Than it used to be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. There's definitely more slutting around. Mm. Um, I want to go back. Uh, to your interests because I'm very you know the things that you wanted to focus on mm -hmm. so I want to know about the evolution of your interests what are things that you've tried that you maybe liked don't like anymore used to do don't do now vice versa things you want people to understand you don't do at all like <laughs> that you know those are I find those interesting because I feel like over the years I've evolved mm -hmm. in my own interests of like oh you know before I would do this and enjoy doing this and now I'm like eh, I'm kind of more interested in this now so how does what were what was the evolution of the things your own kinks and fetishes and what mm. you kind of your process with people that's a good question because honestly I can't really think of anything that I don't enjoy doing yeah. at all. Okay. Now there's not something that I really, really hate. I mean, if I was going to say it's something I'm really not crazy about is, mm, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything. You're putting me on the spot. However, my interests have changed. Yeah. So in the beginning I was very big into flogging. I loved flogging mm -hmm. and I enjoyed spanking. 
And now I have, and my bondage back then was very simple. It was more leather cuffs, you know, a little bit of collar, a little bit of ankle and wrist restraints. So as I got more experienced, I was able to expand my love of bondage. And now I would say bondage is probably one of my favorite things to do in to come up with new ways to do it because I have been doing bondage for so long. It's a challenge for me to think of what I can do, which is why if you look at my Twitter and my social media, you'll see like the theme bondage. Yeah. No. And it's because to me that's something artistic. It's a new way of doing it. Yeah. And it's not the same old let's just tie them down. Yeah. No? Medical was something that was was interesting to me and it kind of started with a little bit of enema play which I really enjoyed and I used to do a lot of enema play but that fetish has seemed to died off in the last couple of years so I don't I know I don't get as many enema boys as I used to and I used to love getting in the enema play because I really enjoyed like the mixtures and the punishment and the retention yeah. and putting them in predicament bondage and seeing if they could hold it yeah you know? but I don't get that as much as I used to mm. it's oh, also something I don't know well I'm fine that fetishes are, are uh, cyclical they come in and they go. Yeah. And one year, you know, fisting will be big, and the next year, animals will be big, and then needles <laughs> what's, will what's be big. The, what's the message that goes out, everyone? It's fisting this it's, year. It's fisting year. This, year. this is this is fisting year. You fisting you know year. what? If you're into these other things, you are not in season or in style. And that's what it is. <laughs> it's like what's in season for your fetish now? Yeah. <laughs> but I think that one thing that did evolve as uh, like my bondage did was also my needlework oh. and when I started I learned them and it was very superficial yeah. it was just you know like kind of the chest and the back and the, the foreskin and the scrotal thing and now I love doing elaborate art designs yeah. uh, full you know suspension with needles and tying people down so I think that to answer your question very simply, I think the basic skills and the basic activities, I, I pretty much enjoy most of them still. Yeah. But there are a few that have evolved in intricacy and complexity that I enjoy a lot more. Any pet peeves? Like any session pet peeves, client pet peeves, activity pet peeves, or limits your boundaries when it comes to those? Well, I am what I would consider an old-fashioned dom. And I don't do a sexual exchange at all. Yeah. So you're not going to get forced by, mm. you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to get fucked with my strap on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I may do it if I know you and you have earned it and yeah. you are a regular or one of my stable and I own you, then yeah. that's a privilege. Something that I kind of reserve for those that actually serve me on a regular basis. Mm. So but if you, you just call me and say, hey, I want you to fuck me in the ass, I'm going to tell you, I just did. Click. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> That's interesting. So do you find that like strap on play and all of that was something that came on later? Was, you know, you know, it became very popular later. later. Yes. Okay. It, and, and it, it, I would say last year was the in season for strap on. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, we always, you know, it was always there. Yeah. It, it's always been a fetish activity, but strap on, I think a lot of it has to do with clips for sale. Yeah. And the the X videos, yeah, the, the short videos. So I think that that has a lot to do with it becoming more acceptable. And if you, as a pro dom, do that in your clips for sale, someone's going to want to do it in session. Yeah. And you have to decide: Are you comfortable with that, or is that a hard limit in actual session just for video? Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, any other ones? Pet peeves: Don't be early. Don't be late. Yeah. <laughs> if your appointment is seven o'clock. 6.59 is fine. Yeah. <laughs> 6.45 is not, and 7.15 is not. Yeah. Do not show up uh, in, inebriated or stoned, and also be very polite. That's probably about it. And be clean. No. Yeah. Take, that's probably one of my biggest things is, you know, please have taken a shower and be presentable. You know, if you come from work, let me know ahead of time. I have a shower here. I can let you take a shower before recession. Yeah. So that that's probably about And don't try to touch me. <laughs> if I let you touch me, if I give you the privilege of worshiping my feet, my hands, my ass, that's fine. But don't try to do the whole, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Without mm. permission. Right. Have mm. you seen, you know, since you've been in the business for so long, have you seen those changes where you've seen more intertwining of like 
you know, more sensual or sexual activities with Dom work? Like, what are your views and how you've seen that? I've actually interviewed a few Doms who've been in the business for a really long time, mm -hmm. and then this is something that we talked about, like these changes, right? And maybe it has to do, obviously, with the internet. Mm -hmm. um, like, I find that really fascinating where a lot of the Doms I've talked to who've been in the business a long time, it was very, like, what they called very classic domination, Correct. which was, you know, none of, like, you never got nude, you know, there was never intimate worship. Right. There was never any, like, really there was never any uh, of a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there was never, like, it was very clear, like, what you were there for. And it was very clear. And now I think it's a lot more mixed, right? Oh, There's 100%. A it, it is definitely a lot more fluid and a lot more mixed. And I don't want to say that's that's a good thing or a bad thing because yeah. it it is the times. Yeah. But I consider myself a classic dom because of how long I've been doing it and when I started. And when I started, we were trained that you do not take your clothes off mm -hmm. under no circumstances. There's no queening. There's no breast worship. There's nothing sexual at all. Yeah. And there's a distance between you and the client. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now there's a lot more. I see a lot more younger doms with no top on, or totally naked in session, mm -hmm. or doing queening and doing the force by and, and getting into you know cuckolding is very big now. When it wasn't cuckolding is very in right now. It's very in. Maybe yeah. it's the trend this year. <laughs> it might be the trend this yeah. year. And those were things that those were boundaries that we didn't do. Now we may have done cuckolding in our personal life. Yeah. But if I have a, a client that's going to want, you know, wanted to come see me for cuckolding, it would be like, no, yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. So there was a very clear distinction of what you did and did not do with a client yeah. and what boundaries were crossed. And I think that right now they are much more fluid. And I, I think that besides the internet, yeah. I think that our changing, uh, societal roles of gender and what is acceptable and how open sex work is now is also affecting it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of changing with the times. Yeah. And I'm not going to say that one is right and one is wrong. Yeah. This is just the way I was raised, the way I was trained is that this is a boundary you have and you yeah. do not let your clients do X. Yeah. So if another younger Dom chooses to, that's great. That's her prerogative. Yeah. But it's something that those of us who have been around for a long time don't consider classic domination. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, like, I think it's interesting. I don't think there's, like you are saying, there's anything wrong with either. I think yeah. everyone, that's the great thing about being an independent, you know, woman is, like, you run your scene the way you run your scene. Correct. You know? Um but it's always good to just be clear about whatever your boundaries are. Mm -hmm. And it's also for those of you out there is like, don't expect that if you see one Dom and they act one way means that's how that person is going to act. You know, another person is going to act. you like, you can't expect everyone to be the same. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just, you know, what, and I think that's the only thing I have issues with sometimes is like, and this is, I think more on the client side of like, it's kind of like if you go to an Italian restaurant, the next Italian restaurant is not going to be exactly the same. Yes, yes, you know? I, yeah. I hate when they come to me and say, yeah. oh, but she, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did this. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> You're not with so-and-so right now. You're with yeah. me, and this is the way we do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's the, the interesting thing. It's like not all doms are made the same. Right. We, we all play very differently, and that's the beauty in it. And that's the, that's a great thing about this industry is that there is someone out there for every single one of us. Yeah. Or, you know, but every sub can find a dom that fits their view and fantasy of what a dom should be. Mm. Yeah, definitely. You, know? mm. you like curvy, that's great. You like blonde, that's great. There's, you know, <laughs> you like hardcore sadist, that's great. You like more sensual mommy, that's great. There is someone out there now and it's much easier to find them because yeah. of the internet now. So that is a good side effect. <laughs> So what would you say, you know, what do you see for the future of kind of kink and BDSM and sort of this more alternative sexuality? Is it, and also, are you hopeful? Are you a bit scared, especially with SESTA FOSTA? Like what, you know, how do you, what are you kind of noticing and how do you feel 
like what is the future going to be like <sighs> okay <laughs> <laughs> my husband and i have talked about this we've had quite a few conversations yeah. and a few years ago we you noticed a there was a huge upswing in the visibility of our community yeah both uh, lifestyle and professional yeah. Doms were everywhere. We were coming out. It was on TV. It was in movies. I mean, look, we had Fifty Shades of Grey, but let's not yeah. go there. <laughs> so there's a huge visual and societal openness of our kink. Yeah. And then it did this. Mm. And it started to shut. Mm. It was kind of, to me, it's kind of like we reached the pinnacle of the mountain, and now the rock is, is starting to fall down the other way. And one of the comments that my husband made was, you know, it's going to go back underground. It's mm -hmm. open. It's been, it's been so open. It's been so open. It's been out in the community. It's been out in, you know, Instagram, Twitter. He goes, it's got to start. The pendulum has to start swinging back. And I was like, no, 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 no. It's, 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 we're going to keep going. We're going to, everybody's going to accept us. Kumbaya. Everybody's going to be happy. <laughs> you know? And no, sure as shit, he was right. Yeah. And I think that we're going to have to, unfortunately, be a little bit more careful about how we express ourselves. Yeah. And we don't, unfortunately, have lobbyists behind us. Yeah. We don't have political power behind us. We have a few organizations that support us, a few organizations that, that help us, but we don't have the dollars to throw to get laws passed. Yeah. All we can do is organize, 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 protest, 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 and that's great, and I think we need to do as much of that as possible, but I do think, unfortunately, as pros, we may have to be a little bit careful and... I don't want to say hide because I don't want to hide. I never have been hiding, but just yeah. be a little bit more careful about what we're doing because it possibly is going to go underground again. They've already taken look how many of our advertising platforms away. Yeah, definitely. and they're, it's going to keep going. Mm. Yeah, and they're censoring a lot of our like hashtags. Mm -hmm. and... I'm shadow banned as far as I can tell on my Instagram. Oh yeah, I'm shadow banned. Yeah, right now <laughs> I know. So it's like I'm like, why is my Instagram not growing? And my husband's like, you're shadow banned. I'm like, oh great. So yeah, <laughs> like... yeah, I'm shadow banned right now, and so I'm kind of like keeping it on the. It, me too. I kind of took a not right. I took a three day band. break, and everybody's I was like, Twitter what are shadow you? banned a few times. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I don't think I'm Twitter shadow banned, but I know I'm Instagram shadow banned right now. I'm like, yeah. why is my account? dead in the water so yeah it, it's so they're already doing things to undermine us what we have to do is remember that we are all in the fight together yeah and to support each other and do things like this to educate and to help others mm. can I ask you about your husband of course you can. yeah so did you guys meet in the scene yep yeah and well describe the scene <laughs> well I mean, how, if you're open to talking about it. Oh, God, like, everybody knows this story. <laughs> okay, but I like this because I think the number one question I get is always on a lot of this is dating while being a dominatrix and dating while kinky. Like, when do you tell people? How does that look? Could I find someone? And I know a lot of amazing, great stories. It's just people don't talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Because I think as pro-doms, we're supposed to be unattainable. But yes. I'm very open about I have a partner and, you know, and what it is to date a sex worker just in general. And so I like people to talk about their relationship so people understand we are regular human beings <laughs> we are <laughs> even though this is our environment and this is yeah. our office where we are regular human beings <laughs> so uh, but most people yeah. know the story of my husband and I and uh, so basically Mr. Zena who is now in New York uh -huh. introduced me to him cool. and they met at FetishCon my husband was kinky so he knew a few pro doms. He hung yeah. out with Dante Posh. He hung out with Zena, and he was just friends with him. He's a very cool guy, very laid back. He doesn't do that whole. He's not submissive. Yeah. He's a switch. So he doesn't do that whole mistress. What can I do for you, mistress? What can I do for you? Yeah. You know, he's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. So Zena knew that I was uh, divorced and wanted to set me up with him, and I said, you know, no, 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 no. I'm really not interested. So she tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a big medical fetishist so yeah. she wanted to do we at one of our local clubs we she had a fetish night so she wanted to do a medical theme so she had me do the performance with her and then when I walked into the bar I said all right so where is this guy you want me to meet and she goes I have no idea what you're talking about and my husband walked around the corner and I said is that him and she goes well 
maybe. And I said, well, if you told me he was that cute, I would have thought about it. Yeah. And he heard me. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked over and he said, well, flattery will get you anywhere you want to go. <laughs> so, and that's kind of how we met. So we were fixed up by Mr. Zena. Mm. Yeah. And so yeah. he's mm. obviously been super supportive and he's kinky himself. Correct. Mm. Um, do you guys play a lot? Uh, not as much as he wants or as I want. <laughs> we would we would like to play every day, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah. But we do. It is interesting because we have other couples that we're friends with in the pro dom community, yeah. and it's amazing how the husbands and partners all kind of bond together. Yeah. And they end up in like it's coffee clutch. Well, does she do this? Well, yeah, she does it. Does yours do this? Oh, yeah, she does this. So what do you do when she does this? So they kind of got this little support group. Uh, give me your partner's information. I'll, you know. But yeah, so it, it, they kind of get along, and they're all like talking to each other. Like it drives me nuts when they call at three a.m. What do you do? I I answer the phone. So they they kind of developed a little bit of a connection, and yeah, because it is very unique to date a pro dom or any yeah. kind of sex worker. It, it takes a big person. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. It mm. takes a big person to be very. <laughs> yeah, to deal with our crazy lives. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, especially because I don't drink that much, but when I do, like if I'm out with, like I was out with uh, Mistress Tangent, and we. I love Mistress Tangent. Yeah, so we were out, and I blame her. You <laughs> have to drink when you're out with Mistress Tangent. It's yeah, part of the so fun. I blame her. <laughs> it's like, let's have a drink. Okay. And then I was at a strip club, and then I'm calling, you know, my partner, <laughs> and then I'm just like, you know. He was like, you were very feisty. Let's just say that. <laughs> and he was like, you were just saying, I don't love you. <laughs> and I was like, you ignore. He was like, I've learned to ignore when you're mean to me. Because you'll forget about you'll it. You'll forget about it, right. It's just like our natural instinct comes out to be kind of nasty. To be very bitchy. Yeah, <laughs> bitchy and nasty <laughs> and demanding. Yes. And he... <laughs> I do. It's funny. After like a full day of sessions, if he yeah. comes to get me or we go out to dinner or anything, he's like, in a mood, honey? I'm yeah. like, yes. And what are you going to do about it? Yeah. He goes, whatever you want me to do. <laughs> like, that's just because you're a switch and you want me to do it to you. <laughs> yeah. You learn to like, just like, just, it'll pass. Right. Mm. It will pass. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'll get out of my work headspace. I'll get out of my dom yeah. headspace. You know, and it will pass. And it will pass. And... That's, yeah. That's really awesome. Do you guys have an open relationship? Like, is he allowed to play with others? Like, do you have that, or is it very much more of a traditional? Hmm. Uh, we are way, so if you ask my slave, my slave in Washington would tell you that, you know, we have an open relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and I would agree with that to a certain point. We are yeah. both allowed to play with other people. Okay. But we do not engage sexually with other people unless okay. there is discussion ahead of time and permission so okay. we are i guess a form of polyamory yeah but not traditional polyamory yeah. if there There's is a, such a thing as traditional yeah. polyamory but everybody has their own dynamic okay and cool. just like you know yours and yours partner your partner it's very unique yeah and ours is very unique as well mm. okay you know, so yeah he he has a boy in dallas who mm. serves him and, oh yeah, he's a really cute boy. So, and then I have my slaves that you know. Some of them serve both of us as a couple. Yeah. Some of them are just mine. Yeah. So, but there isn't any sexual contact between other people besides him and I. Yeah. Well, that I think is very helpful. I think people get really scared about what it means to date while being kinky, mm -hmm. and it's not that bad. It's just mm -mm. you know, if you're in the community long enough and you find things hang out with people who have the same interests that you can talk about it, it's like anything else, right? Right. It's like if you, you know, like baseball yeah. or like wrestling or... Yeah, you know. just <sighs> do, go to these things enough and right. you'll meet people. <laughs> and you'll meet people, exactly. Just get out there, yeah. go do things. Be respectful. Be respectful. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> don't, you know, play with yourself while you're standing around naked at a play party, <laughs> especially mine. <laughs> so... Yeah, there's, it's just like anything else. Mm. Um, so we like to have this like question. Um, it's a little our playful question that we have of okay. vices and virtues. So um. what are some of your vices and virtues? And they can be anything. They can be play related, kink related. They don't have to. Hmm. They can just be, you know, just you as an individual. Okay, so one of my vices is my bondage has to be symmetrical. 
Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I tried to do asymmetrical bondage on one of my slaves, and, and it, it didn't just, last. It just, like, it, freaked you out. It just freaked me out. I said, I got to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so he thinks it's funny because he's like, all right, ma'am, you're going to try to do this asymmetrical bondage scene. We did. And he got 10 minutes into it, and I'm like, I can't do it. I got to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so cannot handle asymmetrical, and also everything has to be tight yeah. if it's a loose rope. I have to redo it because I don't like loose ropes because then what's the point? Yeah, no. definitely. I'm also very, very OCD about my dungeon. Everything has to go in a particular place. Ooh. And if you rent from me or use my space, I, we give you the tour and I go through everything. And if you don't put it back, I'm just going to be like, God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so everything it has a, a label and a place for my, in my dungeon. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, which I guess is also a virtue. A virtue yeah. because then it's organized, it's clean. You go to the same place every time and you get the same equipment. So uh, virtue, I guess, would also be that I'm very open to discussing kink with anyone. Yeah. I have been out. I'm out in my community. I am an educator, an author. I have, like I said, the, the podcast. So I think being able to empathize with people who have a variety of kinks is yeah. one of my virtues. Mm. I think that's, I mean, you've, like, since we started talking, you've always been really open, and I think that's really amazing. Well, thank you. You mm. know, it makes it easy you know, to discuss things that are very, that is usually quite uncomfortable for people. Right. And, and, and that's part of this, I think, with, as a pro, a lot of our time is spent talking. Yeah. You know, and, and getting the people that come to see us a, a, more comfortable. Yeah. Because some of them have never done it before. Yeah. And they feel, you know, strange about their fetish. They don't know how to express it. Or they had a bad experience. Yeah. Or they were abused. So we are the ones they choose to share that with. And we should very take that to trust. Definitely. And not, yeah, okay. I would love to humiliate you. I'm going to love to embarrass you. But I'm not going to do so in such a negative way that it's going to leave you with a bad experience. Yeah. Unless we've agreed right. that we're going to go that far exactly yeah. the consent non-consent thing <laughs> um i'm gonna ask you a few uh another question more advice but mm -hmm. i'm gonna give people time to ask questions so those of you who have been patiently waiting and i saw some people actually answer some some of you about <laughs> you know waiting for the questions if you have a question please um please ask it you're welcome to ask it um ask it respectfully and you know i'll read them um, to you, but I'll ask uh, some questions while people want to okay. put their questions. Well, hopefully, up. they'll ask some questions. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they're so maybe too you're, scared. I always <laughs> like um, hearing advice. So, what are here? It's weird how many pro doms post stuff about how they would never date a sub. Is that a question or a Is statement? That, yeah. Um, okay, if you want to ask that in a question, you're totally welcome to. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Uh, what does that mean to you? I have a different opinion than my best friend. <laughs> my best okay. friend is a lifestyle dom in Florida, and she married her submissive. Mm. Yeah. And I know many, many doms who do marry their submissives, so that's not uncommon yeah. for us to date a submissive or marry a submissive. Yeah. However, I chose not to because I prefer someone who can tell me no. Yeah. My husband is very stubborn, very strong, and I, I'm not saying submissives aren't strong because they need to be strong, but I need someone who has a little bit more balance Yeah, and is not just always submissive to me. Mm. Yeah. So, and I, that's just my own personal preference. I know plenty of people who do date and love and marry their submissives, and I love my submissives. I just don't think I could be married or partnered to one Yeah. because of the dynamic. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. I know a lot of friends who, and I have those friends who never proed, you mm -hmm. know, they have always been lifestyle, and for them, the reason why they've never done professionals, for them, it's a certain, it's a different dynamic. It's right. very much more intimate and emotional, mm -hmm. and they like to to include a very sexual aspect to it. And that's my girlfriend. Yeah, in their, life, right. yeah mm. in their lifestyle. And so for them, it actually is more conducive to their personality to marry, marry. or mm -hmm. be with the submissive because that is what they want all around in their personal life. And I think... Correct. Yeah, for me, there is 
that separation, you know, like I need that separation. I need a little bit of separation. I yeah. am with you. Mm. And so I, you know, most of the time I date men who have, you know, a very flexible alpha personality. That's a great way to put yeah. it. <laughs> Honey, you're flexible. So, <laughs> um, Prodoms, uh, well, there are a lot okay. of statements, not questions. Um, well, um, I'm not going to really answer, answer that. that. <laughs> that's that's, that's something really you might want to ask your, your physician. Yeah, mm, that one's, right. um, do you mm. prefer rope or straps or both for bondage? Oh, well, when I started my career, I would tell you that I was not a rope dumb. I do not engage in shibari. I yeah. love the way shibari looks, but I don't have the patience for it. Yeah. But the older I've gotten, the more involved my ropes have gotten, and they've taken on a hint of shibari because I've gone to some seminars. So I'm still going to say I prefer straps Yeah. because I love the tightness of straps and being able to cinch them down. Yeah. But I like straps combined with rope. I'm the kind of dom who combine everything. I agree. I like a mix of everything, like heavy metal, leather, mm -hmm. ropes. Yes. Would What would you recommend for chastity devices? Would it include a urethral sound? Well, most of the urethral sound ones have to have a PA. Uh, there's, I think, maybe one or two that have just the urethral sound going down a little bit into it. Yeah. But most of them have to have a piercing. So if you're not pierced, then that one's probably not going to work for you. Mm. There is a new site called Evotion, which is like devotion without the D. And it's the one device that my sissies use. Ooh. And it's you should look it up. It's they're really good. Mm. Yeah, you know how most of the chassis devices they tend to have really really long cages. Yeah, these have shorter cages, and they tend to compress and hold and they stay on a little bit. So they are more suited for people of different dynamics. Mm. Yeah, that's really great because some you know I feel like ch chastity devices are one of those things where unfortunately you kind of have to try a few of them. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes you have to get a custom one, but sometimes you don't, you mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like people who can get a suit right off the rack and sometimes you need to get it a little fixed, right? Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes you got nip here, tuck here. Now, uh, my husband enjoys the metal devices. Yeah. So he likes uh, sex and metal and metal, oh God, I can't remember the name. Metal bound, metal, metal works, bound. metal. Yeah. yeah, so we really enjoy those. I really don't do a lot with the Lori's belt. I find that it's a yeah, difficult those. device, and uh, people who have had it have had to get it fit once, twice, three times, yeah. and it never really kind of sits correctly. Mm. So. I find mm. that if you're really serious about chastity um, and really enjoy it, then a PA there piercing. There you go. Thank you. Steel yeah. works. That's it. <laughs> Um, a there we go. Thank you. Really <laughs> yeah, mistress um, is old. It's okay. <laughs> that I find PA piercings are really good. I know it can sound scary, but like those but they are work. the best, and they work. They so work. my slave pain puppy, we got as part of his chastity ritual. Yeah, I'm mentoring a couple, and uh, that's what he uses. Mm. He says, "What do you call an alpha flexible person who enjoys being a sub sexually but not dom sexually?" There's someone who enjoys, enjoys having books. fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. If you are dominant in your day-to-day -day life and you want to be sexually submissive one day and then you want to be mm -hmm. sexually dominant another day, totally fine. Right. You're most probably a switch. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, we're more on one side, some we're on the other, and some we're just scattered in the middle. Most people are scattered in the middle. Like for me, I've always been on the dominant side. Mm -hmm. I've played a little with submission, and I'm like, eh, yeah, don't for me, like no. It. Mm -mm. You know, <laughs> when my husband yeah. and I started dating, we did a little bit, and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, this just isn't you know, work you, for me. You know, <laughs> you, you try because yeah. I think the best things in life is to try a little. So, uh, mistresses, I want advice. Would you give new dominus starting off as pro doms? Oh, what advice would you give new dominus starting off? So the first piece of advice I would give them is don't let anybody else tell you what your style is. Yeah. Be your own person, develop your own kind of style. If you want to be a stern mommy, that's great. If you want to be a hardcore leather dom, that's great. So find out what's in your heart and what you want 
and stick with your style. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Second one is learn, 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 learn. Talk to other doms, go to classes, go to lifestyle events, read books, read um, Periscope, yeah. <laughs> podcasts, learn as much as possible and keep growing your skill because that's what's going to get you to 25 years. Yeah. Not looking cute in lingerie, which that's great if you look at, you know, I, hopefully I still look cute in lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> but your skill is what's going to be your dynamic for as you go through your career. So Definitely. learn as much as you can. Because this is also a, an industry that it's so intimate, like you mm -hmm. and one other person. Right. That the fake it to make it doesn't really work. No. You nope. know, it they does feel not. it, they see it. If they you're, know it. Yeah, if you're in this business just for money, first off, you're not going to make as much as you think. Exactly. Second off, <laughs> there's a lot of other things I could be doing need, and making a lot, a lot more, more money. money. This is not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> this, well, these are real. This is not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, but skills, skills are really going to define everything yes. um, because eventually, like, looking pretty is not going to hold it. Is that going to hold it? No. It really isn't. No. And even if I decide to close my dungeon down yeah. you know, in Chicago, which I'm not going to do, I still have my skill set. And I can go anywhere. And that's why you see so many of us touring. You know, I can go to New York and I can visit yeah, lovely lady here. And I can still work. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm. No, just because someone has the most toys, which there's a few of us that love toys. <laughs> Hi, rubber studio. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't make you the best dom out there. But the fact that she knows how to use all those toys. Yeah. That makes her one of the best doms out there. Mm. Yeah. Is that she can put someone in it safely and get them out of it safely. And she doesn't freak out if there's an incident. Incident. Yeah. No. Know what you're doing. Mm. Yeah. I definitely agree. And. And don't go into this business if you think it's just about the money because it's not going to work out. Or if you hate men. That's what it is. Yes, I was just going to say that. So let me tell you something here. People ask me all the time if I yeah, have been a pro down for 25 years because I hate men. No, I have been a pro down for 25 years because I love men. Yeah. I like what I do. I enjoy the opposite sex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why would I want to spend 25 years of my life seeing naked men, men. and if touching you, naked men <laughs> if I hated men. <laughs> it would be like the worst job ever. It would be the worst job ever. It would be like, no. But I love causing sensations in people. Yeah. And I'm bisexual, so I see women as well. Yeah. So, But if you don't enjoy men specifically, which is 75 to 80% of our client base, then this is not the job for you. Mm. Yeah. So someone asked, do you consider domination an art form? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. And my slaves are my canvas. Look at look at my Instagram feed. You'll see my and look at my fet life. So yes. Yeah. Can you do remote domination using? I don't know what that. I don't know what those are on a subscription basis. I we I, I don't even. Know I don't what know what is. those are. You you'll have to tell us what those are. Well, remote <laughs> domination can be done in multiple ways. That I can do. The remote domination Skype, I do. Phones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There night are, flirt. Yeah, night flirt. Uh, there mm -hmm. are Bluetooth locks for chastity mm -hmm. keys. Um, I do a lot of scheduling, require people to post mm -hmm. things on Twitter, send me, there's a lot so of So you apps. know and I do the same thing. Yeah. Oh, so I know a lot of apps. apps that don't like that. I enjoy it. I love schedule control, yeah. life control, and, you know, write text and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I actually utilize some business apps mm. that are made for companies around the world to work together. I use that for exactly the same thing, but do it with my slaves. <laughs> you and I are going to have to talk about those yeah. when we're done here. I want to know what they are. <laughs> so um, we are going to wrap up, but uh, with us wrapping up, uh, Simone, can you give us all the ways people can contact you? So your social media, your mm -hmm. website, and give them those information. Certainly. Thank you. So my Instagram is Chicago Mistress, if it comes up. <laughs> my Twitter is Chicago Mistress, and that's all one word. My Facebook is also Chicago Mistress, I believe, but you may also have to find me under Mr. Simone Worthington, okay. because on Facebook you have to have a last name. Yeah. yeah, and on Tumblr, I am also Chicago Mistress. So basically, just look up Chicago Mistress as one word, or Mistress Simone, and you'll find me. My website is Chicago-Mistress.com, and my Gmail is Chicago Mistress. 
Great. So my podcast is um, The Femme Dom Mystique, and it has about, I want to say, 14 to 15 episodes right now. And hopefully one more when I go to New York, I can interview you. <laughs> and, I and I also do writing. Uh, if you go to my website, there's lots of articles up there. I have a blog that's connected on my website. And I think those are most of the ways you can find me. Awesome. So I want to thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Simone, for doing this interview with me. And it was my pleasure. And for you guys, I don't know who we have next week. But uh, tune in Monday, 7 p.m. for those who are new to seeing our Periscope. Thank you again, and have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.